good morning, everybody. Welcome to Riverside Baptist Church. Glad you're here with us on this Sunday morning. We'll start with our children's songbooks uh, in number 87, Fishers of Men. If you can stand with me, we'll sing that. Fishers of Men, number 87. Anybody have a favorite this morning that they'd like to sing? Nora? Amazing Grace. Amazing Grace. All right, let's turn to Amazing Grace. And that is number 336. 336. 336. We'll sing the first and the second of 336. into Please be seated, and again, welcome uh, to our Sunday morning service. Uh, just a couple of announcements uh, that we have the Terryville Fair coming up at the end of the month, uh, Vision Sunday on September 8th, and then the Mum Festival Parade at the end of September. Continue to be in prayer for Pastor and his family. They're on vacation this week as well. Um, and before we dismiss to our classes, any birthdays or anniversaries in the last week? We have one. When was your birthday, Micaiah? July 30th. So just last week. Anybody else with a birthday or anniversary? All right. Let's sing happy birthday. <clears throat> All right. We're going to sing it a cappella. All right. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, God bless you. Happy birthday to you. All right. Well,
we'll dismiss now to our classes. We'll start with our tiny tots. You can go with Mrs. Marcella. Mm -hmm. Oh, I'm sorry, not Mrs. Marcella. And then we'll junior church. We'll dismiss junior church next. All right, and everybody else can stay in here with uh, Brother Frazier. Exodus 27 is where we are. Through the adult Sunday school, we've been going through Exodus, our study through the book of Exodus for a very long time. But it's been such an encouragement to me um, to look at Exodus in kind of a different, um, a different light and just so many encouraging things here. I think we can, we definitely uh, overlook and uh, just praise the Lord for all that he is doing through this. So Exodus chapter number 27, we're actually in the second section of this, uh, of this chapter. And uh, we've talked about, we've been talking about, we've been going through the tabernacle and talking about the symbolism for each of the different furnishings of the tabernacle. And I think it's really interesting how every part of the tabernacle points to Jesus Christ. And uh, we talked about the, um, the altar of incense, the menorah, the light, uh, stick the altar of incense uh, representing that we can have prayers and intercession with God the uh, the candlestick the menorah Representing that God is the light. He lights our path and the table of showbread that God is uh, the giver He's the bread of life. He sustains us We looked at the inner veil and the outer veil representing that Jesus Christ is the door and that no man comes unto the Father But by him we looked at when Jesus Christ died the the veil was torn in two ripped from top to bottom showing that Jesus Christ could have only done that uh, giving us access to the holy, the most holy place, the holy of holies, and we look at that in the last uh, in the last couple chapters. But we're here in this in chapter twenty seven, um, and we looked at the brazen altar and just basically reminded of the judgment and that uh, there was a sacrifice that needed to be uh, had a price that needed to be paid so that we could be forgiven, so that we could have redemption. And now we're here in the second section of Exodus chapter number twenty seven. Uh, and we're looking at the court. And so I've kind of titled this uh, sermon. We didn't finish it from last week, so we're going to finish the last point today. Um, but this, the title of this is From the Outside In. From the Outside In. So we're looking at the courtyard, uh, the structure of the tabernacle, just kind of painting the picture that I did last week. If you think of the kind of the geography of what's going on here in this chapter, they're in a desert. So in a desert land, you can imagine... Uh, deserts that you know of, sandy, rocky, dry, hot. And the people, they lived in these kind of goat skin, like really black, dark brown type of tents. And, but the structure of the tabernacle is very interesting because the walls, if you will, what bordered the tabernacle from inside outside was these white linen cloths. And so just a very, very kind of unique thing in this type of a setting. And it was also different from what the people usually lived in. So if you were kind of neighbors to this idea, you could see this from far away. If you were just a commoner, you saw kind of the, the white linen border that, that, uh, that kind of bordered this structure of the tabernacle. Because inside of that, when you walk through the first veil or curtains, you're met with the brazen altar and then the tabernacle structure is there to the holy place. And then inside of that, as you go further back, it's the most, it's the holiest of holies. But the point that I want us to kind of get with the courtyard, and this is actually a little bit uh, more challenging to get something out of, but I think God, I think God has given us something that we can consider. And this is the point I want us to kind of think about as we talk about the courtyard. And the fact is this, God has shown us the results of his love from the outside to get us in. Now he wants to work his love within us so that we can show it outwardly. Does that make sense? So if we look, last week we looked at the division and we talked about how the people, again, they lived in, uh, they lived in like these black goat haired tent things. And so it was completely different than from the structure of the tabernacle, uh, at least these walls anyway. And we, we looked at how different it was from the inside of the courtyard to the outside of the people. So when the people looked at the direction of the tabernacle, they were met uh, with, the, with the white linen cloth, which represents God's righteousness. 
which represents uh, his purity. And we see that from the beams, the pillars that were used to hold up those claws, that silver was, uh, was at the top of, of them. I don't remember if it was sockets or what they called the silver at the top, but silver represents redemptions. And so people that were in the world, just like you and me, when we look to God, maybe uh, God's holiness, God's righteousness, God's purity uh, gets our attention and gets us looking in a way that is different than the life that we lived. And if you're saved today, the life that we, we used to live. And so the division, there is a division between God's people and the world. And we see that multiple times throughout the book of Exodus alone, where God even says that he puts a division between his people and the people of the world. And so that white linen cloth there uh, was put there to represent that there is a difference between what's happening in the holy place and then what's happening in the world. But it's amazing thing that the, the access to God, although God is righteous and that he's holy and that this white linen cloths that were used to uh, make the walls of the tabernacle, we find in the New Testament that Jesus Christ was, was wrapped in this same kind of cloth. Uh, and we find that, um, uh, that the, when the saints get taken up into heaven, we're going to be wearing the exact same things. Uh, so just kind of um, backing up the point that uh, this white linen cloth representing God's purity and righteousness, what kind of directs us, what kind of gets our attention to move toward him in the first place, there was a division between his people and God's people. And from the outside, we can make a notable distinction that God, what we were moving towards, is a lot different than how I'm living. And so the, the first thing that we looked at with this idea of from the outside in is that there was a division. There was something different about God that got his people moving toward him. Well, the next thing we looked at was the distinction. And so we already alluded to some of this already. But the, the, um, the linen cloth, again, represented his purity and his righteousness uh, as where we, we could not have any of that without God in the first place. And so I won't spend too much time going there. Uh, but we see here that uh, one thing I want to note, too, is that if you wearing the right things doesn't always mean that you're righteous and holy. And so the, we know the saints are going to be wearing this white linen cloth when they get taken up into heaven. We know that uh, Jesus Christ was wrapped in this same linen cloth stuff. But we also find that uh, this this stuff was very was very hard to find. It was really hard to make. And so. Uh, not only was Jesus wearing this in the New Testament, not only will the saints be wearing it when we get taken up into heaven, but rich people could also wear this if because they could afford to they could afford the process, they could afford the people. And so you would find that rich people are also wearing this this cloth. And so in the New Testament we know the, the rich man and the beggar, Lazarus, and we see how there is a rich man that is in hell who is wearing the, the fine linen. And so just because you're wearing the right stuff, just because you're doing the right things, it doesn't make you any bit more righteous or, or pure. Uh, it's what's on the inside. It's what's on our hearts. And so I was reading my devotions in, in the Gospels, and it's, what's co it's that which comes out of a man that what defiles him, not what comes in. And there are definitely defiling things that we can allow in, like pornography or alcohol and things like that. I'm not saying that things don't affect us on the outside, but Jesus tells us, and I think we're, we're going to allude to this in the morning service, but that which comes out of us, that comes out of our mouth, that, that comes out in our actions, that is what defiles a man. And so we see here this idea of uh, from the outside in talking about the courtyard. Uh, the first thing that you are met with when your eyes meet the structure entirely of the tabernacle, you can't see behind the walls. And the people that are inside the courtyard, that are inside of God's presence, if you will, they, the, the walls were above eye level. So you, can't, you could not see what was going on in the world, and the world could not see what was going on in God's place. But I think that alludes to the fact that uh, the people, the priests, and people that would go in and make sacrifices and try and speak to God, they were not distracted by what was going on in the world. In fact, they were just focused on God's presence. So that's my way of recap there. Uh, we'll go ahead and we'll... Uh, we'll talk about the, we'll go to our last point. If you have your notes from last week, we talked about the division. We talked about the distinction. And today we're going to talk about the direction, the direction. Let's go ahead and we'll read here. Uh, Exodus 27 verses 9 and 10. And thou shalt make the court of the tabernacle for the south side southward. There shall be hangings for the court of fine twine linen and of a hundred cubits long for one side. And verse number 10. 
And the twenty pillars thereof, and, the, and their twenty sockets shall be of brass. The hooks of the pillars and their fillets shall be of silver. So when we walk immediately into the courtyard structure, into the courtyard to be met with the tabernacle structure, we immediately see that there is brass all over the place. The first thing you met with is the brazen altar. That's where all the sacrifices were made. And it was the priest that had to make the sacrifices for the people that wanted to be right with God. Now, this is very interesting because there are a lot of people that say you can do good works to attain salvation, that you can pay a certain amount of money to attain salvation, that you can do ordinances or do whatever it is to attain salvation. But the priest had to, they had to uh, be, they had to bring like a, a unspotted lamb, uh, basically something that met the criteria to be a sacrifice in the first place for the priest to be able to represent him and make the sacrifice. Well, God, Jesus Christ, who is our great high priest, has to represent and go before us to God the Father so that we can be in the presence of God in the first place. So you doing good works, you paying a bunch of money, you doing a whole bunch of good things, and you representing yourself is not going to be good enough for you to get one ounce of, of grace or one ounce of heaven, one ounce of a relationship with God. It may, it may increase the quality of life for a little bit, but if you don't have Jesus Christ representing you, then you, there, there's no relationship with God. There's no relationship with him. But here we see the direction. We see we're met with the, with the, bra with the brazen altar where they made sacrifices. And uh, when, you, when you walk inside of the courtyard, the, the pillars of wood were in sockets of brass. And so there's brass all over the place. The outside of the, of the tabernacle, there was brass. And what brass reminds us of in scripture is, is of judgment. It, it reminds us of judgment. And so when we, when we walk in and we, uh, and we are wanting to make God when we are wanted to make our relationship with God right, we are reminded that we deserve judgment. We deserve to die. We, we don't deserve his mercy. We don't deserve his love. We don't deserve the grace that he gives us. And so we can see here, uh, like I alluded to before, that on the top of the pillars, we see it in verse number 10, uh, there shall be fillets, uh, their fillets shall be of silver. So at the top of the, of the pillars that were holding up the fine twine linen, there was silver there. And so it's just very encouraging to me that on man's level, the earth itself, the brass sockets underneath the pillars reminded us of judgment when we're facing him. And brass always speaks of judgment. But if man could only, if we could only look up, we would only see the redemption that God wants to give us. And there's no brass. You can't see any brass from outside of the tabernacle structure. So when we look the way of God, we are only reminded of his purity. We're only reminded of his righteousness. We are only reminded of his redemption that he can give us, that only he can give us when we start walking his way. And man could still know that redemption was available without taking advantage of it. But God forces no one to come to the gate of decision. They have to make, we have to make a decision to go to, to start moving towards God's righteousness. We have to make a decision to start moving towards God's purity. And that's not, I'm not, I'm not saying like with, with, all, with only the big areas of life, like what am I going to do 10 years from now? Or, you know, what, how am I going to parent? That's, I'm talking about all the little things. Um, with my words, with my thoughts, with my reactions, with my responses. We have to make the initial decision to start moving towards God's way, not just in the big things, but in the little thing, in the little mundane things, every, every second, every moment of each day, we have to be making a decision to do what God wants us to do. And when we go through that door, which is only through Jesus Christ, we are reminded constantly that I, that, that I deserve judgment. I can't do this on my own. We got to keep looking up. Because it can be so easy to, to only be, you know, to only be looking at all the bad things and all the bad circumstances and all the people that have harmed us or hurt us or the people that we feel maybe have wronged us or all the bad things that go along in the world. But God simply, he puts that redemption, the silver on top of the pillars so that when we look up, we know that he's there and that all the stuff in my, in my life I don't have to focus on all the stuff on my level, but I can look up to God and say, you know what? My circumstances are not bigger than my God. My challenges are not bigger than my God. As long as I give whatever it is to God, he will put the desire in my heart and he will change me from the inside out. And I've alluded to this before and, I, and I'll say it, I'll probably say it a lot, but um, when we make that decision to trust God, when we make that decision to do the right thing, to do what he wants us to do instead of, instead of doing what we want to do, then God will come behind that decision and he'll change our desires. 
Now, I, I alluded to this in the introduction, but I want to read a couple of these testimonies of people in the Psalms uh, who were inside the courts. In Psalm 65, uh, verse number four, let's actually turn there for a second. Uh, in Psalm chapter number 64, uh, 65, verse number four. And we'll read a whole lot more, but I think this is a really good chapter here. I think this really is a good formula for it's a good formula for what's explaining what's happening here in the courtyard structure. 665, Psalm chapter 65, we'll get in verse number one. Praise waiteth for thee, O God in Sion, and unto thee shall the vow be performed. O that thou hearest prayer, unto thee shall all flesh come. Verse number three here. Iniquities prevail against me, as are transgressions, thou shalt purge them away. But it says this in verse 4, Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causest to approach unto thee, that he may dwell in thy courts. In the courtyard, in the tabernacle, in the, in the courtyard. The, 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 probably you can, say, you can say it this way, it's kind of the least spiritual place out of all of this, but yet it is the, is the first level, if you will, as we are entering into God's presence and getting deeper and further into the most holy place. It is the first place that we must pass in order to get into the, into the most holy place, into, uh, into God's presence, into all of his full, all the fullness thereof of his presence. What we see here that this person uh, in, the, in the Psalms here, I think it's David, uh, in iniquities shall prevail against me. Our transgressions shall thou purge them away. Blessed is the man whom thou choosest and causes to approach unto thee that he may dwell in thy courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy. And there the word is of thy holy temple. Now, I guess this is kind of another side point that we can think of, but. All of us, I don't want to assume that anyone is saved. If you're here today and you're saved, if you're watching online and you're saved, then you have entered into the gates of God. You've entered into the court. You've entered into his presence. You have a relationship with God. And it's because you realize that you were a sinner that cannot do anything about their sin that you went to him in the first place. Now, the temptation or the problem, if you will, is that after salvation, sometimes our fire kind of dwindles down a little bit. Sometimes our reliance on God kind of dwindles down a little bit, and we start relying more on our good walk rather than on Jesus Christ. But you see, if, if we keep the main thing the main thing, that listen, I am a, I, I'm, I'm not only saved, but I am a saved sinner, that I still do wrong, that my iniquities need to be purged away from me. The, David here is, is alluding to the fact, listen, that my iniquities need to be gone, that blessed is the man who, whom thou causes to walk to him, to go to the courts in the first place. And now when they walk through the doors, now standing in the courts, verse number four, at the end of verse number four, it says, we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even of thy holy temple. Now, here's the question. If you're here and you're saved and you have a relationship with God, you've entered into the courts. You know God's goodness. You know what he can do. You know what he's done. So it really doesn't make any sense for us when we know God wants us to change something. We know God wants us to go somewhere or not go somewhere. We know what God has to offer. We know that when God is attacking something, he's attacking the worldliness and sinfulness and the iniquities that are in our hearts. But here's the question. Once we have entered into God's presence, whatever level you're in, are you satisfied? Is, is God's goodness, is God's redemption, is God's provision, protection, is his light, is his, is his sustenance. Once you've had a taste of God, once you've had a taste of what Jesus Christ, the peace, the joy that he can bring, is that enough to keep you in the courtyard? Is that enough to keep you in his presence? Are you satisfied with what, God has to, with, with, with what God has given you already. You see, because, again, I, I mentioned that the, the walls of the courtyard, they were above eye level, so that the priests and the people that were trying to get right with God, they would not be distracted at all with the world. And so the problem is, once we walk through those curtains, we're, once those people that wanted to get right with God, once the priests walked through, they're saying, listen, I want to be in God's presence, and God is saying, these walls are eye level, you can't see what's I don't want you to be distracted, but you want to know what we do in our life? We kind of keep the door open to our, to our old sin. We kind of keep a bridge. We kind of keep uh, something connected to how we used to act and how we used to respond and what we used to say and what we used to do. Where when we walk into the courtyard, the curtains close right behind us. 
and there are walls all around that we can't even see the old life that we used to live. And so as we are drawn from the outside to go inside of the court, God begins working on us from the inside out. But you see, we still like to kind of keep the curtain or keep the door kind of propped open, if you will, to the things that we used to do. And the problem with that is we, we are no longer satisfied solely on what God can do for us. We're no longer satisfied for what Jesus Christ has given us. And so we start trying to provide for ourselves and we start trying to rely on ourselves. And we start, instead of going to God, instead of being more faithful to church or our Bible reading or praying, instead of, instead of God being the first person to hear our circumstances or our situation, we start gossiping to someone else about it. We start uh, talking to someone else about everything that's going on and we spend days or maybe hours. And I'm not saying it's wrong to go to people, but you want to know what Moses did when the people were complaining, when the people were griping, when the people were walking away from God? You want to know the first thing that Moses did when uh, when people were, uh, you know, against him and he was trying to lead them, he went straight to God. He was praying. He prayed, hey, listen, God, this is what's going on. I don't think this is fair. What's going on right now, I don't know why I'm feeling this way. He went right to God. He didn't go anywhere else. But you want to know a first key indicator of us not being satisfied with God is that we go somewhere else. We go somewhere completely different than where God wants us to go. And we know the purity. We know that God represents righteousness. We know that God has something that we do not have, that we cannot attain on our own. Peace and joy and purpose and protection and provision and enlightenment and sustenance, it only comes from God, so we can't get it from anywhere else, but we try to get it from somewhere else anyway. And so when we walk through the gates of the, of the court, of the, into the courtyard, we are keeping a curtain open. We are keeping the door to our old sin. We're, we're kind of, we're kind of, uh, just in case, I'm really going through something, I'm, I need to fall back on this. So God, I'm not going to completely give it over to you. Well, that's not the right thing. Are you, are you satisfied? The psalmist here in verse number four tells us that we shall be satisfied with the goodness of thy house, even thy holy temple. But terrible things in, in righteousness wilt thou answer us, O God of our salvation, verse five, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth and of them that are afar off upon the sea. Now, the word terrible in verse number five, it doesn't mean terrible like we would. It's actually pretty, it's pretty ironic. It actually means awesome. Uh, the word terrible, so I'll read it again, just kind of saying the meaning of that word there. By awesome things in righteousness wilt thou uh, answer us, O God of our salvation, who art the confidence of all the ends of the earth, and of them that are afar off upon the sea. And then we'll keep reading, which by his strength, his strength, setteth fast the mountains being girded with power, which uh, stilleth the noise of the seas and the noise of, of, of their waves and the tumult of the people. They also that dwell in the uttermost parts are afraid at thy tokens. Thou makest the outgoings of the morning and evening to rejoice. Now, in verse number five and six, we see here that, Someone who is dwelling in the courts is not only satisfied, but God is their confidence. Now, when you and I got saved, if you're saved here this morning, God, you were confident that God was able to save you of your sins and keep you on the right path. Now, I, I want us to know it was somewhere along our Christian walk, there might be where our path is a little bit diverted. Sometimes we, we stop looking up at God's redemption and we stop looking up at his purity and righteousness and we start looking down and we're looking at our situations and we're looking at what I can do, what I can do, what I can do, and we're not satisfied with God and, he, and we are no longer confident in what he can do. The reason why we sin is because we think that we can provide for us better than God can provide for us. So that's why, we want, that's why we want to make sure our side of the story is always heard. That's why we want to make sure we want someone to know how much wrong they're doing. Or that's why, you know, you know we you think of anything else. Why well, I need to work so, much, work so much at work so that I can get all this money so that I can take care of myself. And then, you know, my, my church, church starts going out the window. My Bible reading starts going out the window. Prayer starts going out of the window. It's because our confidence is no longer in God. I won't ask you to turn here, but I'll read a couple of other testimonies here of people that were in the court. And this is such a powerful one here in Psalms. He's saying all those that are inside that first level of God's presence, we ought to be satisfied with what God has to offer us. And seemingly, as you first walk in, what we're talking about here is like the least spiritual place that you can be. And reminding us of judgment, if you will, I can, if I can say it that way, because there is the holiest place and then there's the most holy place, which is like, you know, like the, that's, that's where God is. That's where he dwells. But we see here that even just journeying back to God, 
even if we get a little bit of him and we're in right standing with him just a little bit, it's enough to satisfy us completely. It's enough for him to do awesome works in our life. And the reason why we don't change, the reason why our reactions, our, our faith doesn't grow, our responses to things or uh, maybe bad habits or hobbies or whatever it is, the reason why that stuff doesn't, doesn't change is that we don't, we don't give God a chance. We don't, really, we don't really give things over to him like we ought to. We don't have confidence in him. But Psalm 84, chapter number, or Psalm chapter 84, verse 2 says, My soul longeth, yea, even fainteth for the courts of the Lord. My heart and my flesh crieth out for the living God. Psalm 84, again, 10, For a day in thy courts is better than a thousand. I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents, right? Again, there were tents surrounding the tabernacle where the regular people, the worldly people live. But he says in Psalm 84, 10, for a day in the courts is better than a thousand. And I had rather be a doorkeeper in the house of my God than to dwell in the tents of wickedness. And then Psalm 92, 13, those that be planted in the house of the Lord shall flourish in the courts of of our God. Now, where are you rooted? Where is your foundation? Is the source of everything that you do and think and believe, is the source of it actually God or is it your own comfort or is it, is it something else? Because it says it right here, Psalm 92, it says, those that are planted in the house of the Lord, they shall dwell, they, they shall flourish, they shall prosper in the courts of God. Now, I guess one application we can make to this, too, is a lot of Christian people today, they're flourishing, yeah, they're prosperous, but they're not in the courts, they're not in God's presence. They're flourishing, they're prospering, they're maybe doing, they're doing okay in an area other than where God is. And so we see here the, the importance of the courtyard is that first level, is that first place that we step into of God's presence. We see the direction that we ought to go. The direction. We ought to go towards God. And we ought to not stop looking up. Reminding ourselves of his redemption. Reminding ourselves of his purity and his righteousness. Because it, there's, so, there's so many things on this earth that will, that will take our attention. But can I tell you, if we actually focus on the things that God, everything that God has given us to do, we would be, so, we would be too busy to worry about the things that we can't control. And so we ought to just serve God because God can control that. God can change things. God can help us. God can provide money. God can provide uh, good circumstances or, or whatever it is that we struggle with or, or, or whatever it is that we need or whatever. The direction in which this tabernacle, the courtyard is showing us is that we ought to keep looking up. That's what directed us there in the first place. And so when, we're, when, we're get, when, we, when you step inside of the courtyard, we're reminded of all this judgment and that we deserve hell. But if you only look up and, 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 and you stop looking down and you stop looking around, you start looking up to God and saying, you know what, God, I, I want to I flourish in your courts. I want to be satisfied. I want, I, I'm confident in what you've given me. You've given me so much already. You brought me out of worse situations even. Why is it so hard for me to trust you now? In Proverbs chapter number four, let's go ahead there. Proverbs chapter number four. And verses 23 through 27. Proverbs 4, 23 to 27. Keep thy heart with all diligence, for out of it are the issues of life. Put away from thee a forward mouth and perverse lips. Uh, put far from thee. Let me just make sure I'm in the right place here. Yep. Put far from thee. Verse 25. Let thine eyes look right on. And let thine eyelids look straight before thee. Ponder the path of thy feet, and let all thy ways be established. Turn not to the right hand, nor to the left. Remove thy foot from evil. In Psalms chapter number 123, verses 1 and 2, it says, Unto thee I lift up mine eyes, O thou that dwellest in the heavens. Behold, as the eyes of servants look unto the hand of their masters, and as the eyes of a maiden unto the hand of of her mistress, so our eyes wait upon the Lord our God until that he have mercy upon us. And so if you are here today and you're not saved, you have, if you're not a relationship with Christ, then you need to get that settled. Right now, and I know we didn't show a picture of this, I think I, I, in the beginning of this study, 
I showed a, a series of videos where I actually found 3D constructions of the tabernacle on YouTube. And I think that's really, I think that's really powerful. I think I'm going to show those again just so we can be reminded of what everything looks like and, again, of the geography and everything that's going on. Um, but if you're not saved here, then you are on the outside. You're on the outside of a relationship with God, and you're trying to, you're trying to get things, you're trying to attain things that are on the inside of his presence. And so in order for you to get a relationship with God, to get the good and, and people are searching for purpose, they're searching for truth and joy, it only comes from him. And so you need, to, you, need to step, you need to step through the door, which is Jesus Christ. You need to allow Christ to represent you and trusting him as your Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, uh, giving, giving him the authority in your life to, to, be, to be Lord and to be, the, and to be the sole purpose of authority. But if you are saved and you've gained access inside is that enough for you to stay? Is Jesus Christ enough for you to want to continue to be more like him? Is Jesus Christ, is what he's done for you already, all the blessings that he's given you, all the deliverance, all the times he's provided and protected you, all the, all the maybe enlightening times where he's given you wisdom for a situation that just seemed impossible, is all of that enough for you to stay in God's presence? Or do you need to be, or do you need to be searching for something? So, do you need to be trying to go back to your old hobbies or habits to try and make yourself feel comfortable or whatever it is? Is God enough? Is he, is, is 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 everything that He's done for you, everything that He's shown Himself to be, is that enough evidence for you to have confidence in Him? We need to dwell in the courts. There are those who would go inside. Uh, there were those who would go inside all of these bizarre places, people who call themselves Christians. They would go inside of a bar. They'll go inside of a, you know, on the Internet. They'll go inside of a website that they should not be going into. They'll maybe put themselves in a situation or they'll go inside of a friend group uh, of people who just are, are, you know, gossiping and talking bad about people or maybe planning out bad stuff. Or maybe they'll, they'll uh, go into some account on streaming services and watch things that are the worst things. They'll go, we'll go inside all these other places with our minds or our actions, but we won't step. But the last thing we think to do is to step foot in the place where we know God is. And I'm not just talking about a physical place. I'm not talking about church. I'm not, although it's important to go to church, but I'm talking about stepping outside of the place of bitterness. I'm, talk, I'm talking about stepping into the place of God's forgiveness and, and God's uh, cleanliness and, and, again, righteousness and purity. Uh, stepping outside of the place of, of, of just being you know, unforgiving or, or whatever it is, or bad thoughts or whatever it is, being degrading or, you know, whatever. Stepping into what God, stepping into his holiness and what God has to offer, we step into all these other places to try and help us, but we don't go to the only place, or the only person that can help us. And where all the stuff that we're looking for, it only comes from this one place. It only comes from this one person. And so we ought to structure our life in such a way where we are showing, where it's clear to someone who doesn't even know us, that we are, that my utmost, and my utmost confidence, that all of my satisfaction, it comes from Jesus. I like this hymn. Uh, it's called, All That Thrills My Soul Is Jesus. And so is that true for you today? We sing a lot of songs like that, but is that true? Is that the only thing that really thrills us? When, when we hear the gospel, is that something that excites us? When, we hear, when, when we're corrected to do the right thing or to step away, and when a, when a friend comes up and says, hey, listen, this isn't the right thing to do, are we, are we happy about that? Now, I know the answer. I can tell on Paul's face. But, we, but often we're not happy about that stuff. But we ought to be. And Proverbs, you know, it doesn't, at least when I've read Proverbs, reading through, and I've read, I've read it through a whole lot of times, but the emphasis on Proverbs, it doesn't matter where the instruction is coming from. The Bible tells us, in Proverbs at least, that no matter where it comes from, we ought to be teachable and actually consider the instruction, even if someone is wrong. It doesn't matter where it comes from. Now, someone may be completely off base, but it may be that it may be something. Hey, and I, okay, I'll give an illustration here. I used this illustration before, so bear with me. But uh, I worked at Chick-fil-A, and of course, I was really good at it. I worked there for like five years. And so, like, uh, what you have to do with the sandwiches and you in, in the regular sandwiches, you put them in a bag and you roll and you roll it up. So I'm working there for five years. So I'm banging these sandwiches out, you know, boom, bag, flip, flip, you know, roll it up, roll it up, roll it up. And so a new hire comes and I'm training him and, you know, we're starting to get really busy. So I'm like, OK, you know, step aside, junior. I'm going to take care of this stuff. And so I'm banging the stuff out, rolling up the bags, rolling up the bags. And he looks at me and he's like, 
He's like, bro, like, do you roll blunts? And I'm like, how, I'm like, how in the world do you get, like, honestly, we're at Chick-fil-A. Like, are you serious? But, you know, the, and, you know, and I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, dude, like, I've been here forever. But as I'm thinking back to that time, uh, the right reaction, as I'm illustrating it here, is he was completely off base. And the right reaction that God wants us to have is, what did I do to make him think this way? He, he was completely wrong. I've never smoked in my life because of, you know, my family. And we know we, I've shared my testimony before. I've never picked up any drugs ever. But this guy was completely off base. But the reaction that God is telling us to have is to not respond angry or how could you say this or you don't know anything or whatever. But instead be like, what, what, have, I, what have I been doing in my life to show, to show this to this person? Is there something that I need to be changing because my testimony isn't in the right spot? And that's, that's the reaction that God wants us to have. And so uh, that's it there, and I am done. So pretty randomly, I didn't say I was going to do this, but uh, I issued a challenge, a praise God challenge, where uh, we can just stop and praise God for something instead of complaining about something. Maybe there was an old lady or a crippled lady or uh, some type of lady in front of you while you were driving, and there, was, and there was all these red lights or whatever, and instead of complaining and banging your head on the, on the steering wheel, you just stopped yourself and said, Praise God. So I'm going to ask for some testimonies. Does anyone have any testimonies like that at all? And it, yes, Brother Jacob. Um, so I got, it's like traffic. I'm not the biggest fan of traffic. Mm-hmm. But when it was like this week, and there was a lot of traffic. And it was kind of nice because I had some time to listen to God's word, but also just kind of collect throughout the day. And I'm typically like to rush to work. Mm-hmm. Mm, that's good. Yeah, I like how Pastor put it. Like sometimes we feel like we deserve to just get to where we're going without any problems, and uh, it's very, very, very good. Anyone else? Any other testimonies? Any thoughts about the sermon? Anything remi- remind you of anything in your life at all? Don't be bashful. Yes, Miss Margaret. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Amen. That's great. Yeah, Diane. Um, the, there's an elaborate on that when God surprises you with, with honest things like this song. Um, we were telling the dresser, and I was trying to put it in the car, and then all of a sudden somebody showed up and like helped, like lifted this dresser up and shoved it in the back of the kind of truck. Yeah. That's a really good situation for when I'm in the Subaru. Um, yeah, uh, Brother Paul. Yeah, praise God. Uh, church broke down the second time. It <laughs> broke. It was right by Pastor's house. So, and yeah. It was, uh, praise God for that. It was a close by. And I uh, had a crazy situation where I was stuck. And uh, Fraser came by and yeah. helped me get the truck. And yeah, praise God for the fellowship. Yeah, amen. I remember Paul called me and he's like, dude, my, my truck is broke down again. He's like, what am I going to do? But he was like, praise God that I'm right near pastor's house. And I was like, man, that's, that's going to be awesome. I hope you uh, come to Sunday school so I can ask you to give that testimony. But he gave it. Praise the Lord. But that's exactly what we're talking about with this entire series, at least. It's so easy to get bogged down and caught up, you know, that we stop praising God. And so one thing I will say before we quit is um, uh, if you take care of God's time, he will take care of your time. If you do what God wants you to do, we get so worried, oh, what about my time here? What about my time there? What about my time with family? If you are serving God, if you put God as your first priority, God can take care of your family. God can take care of the finances. God can take care. If you put time into God's word and studying his word and reading his word and praying and going to church, if you give time to God, if you do what God says to spend your time doing, he'll take care of your time. He'll take care of everything. that. And I can, and I can give numerous testimonies. We'll be here forever. And Brother Matt will open up the trap door that's behind the pulpit. But if we take care of God's time, 
he will take care of us. He'll take care of our time. He knows what we need. He knows what we want. But he wants to see that we'll put him first in every worrying uh, situation. And so with that, let's pray. Father, we thank you for this time together. Thank you for who you are and all you've done. Thank you for the many testimonies and people being willing to share. I pray, Lord, that uh, this message, Lord, made sense. And, uh, Lord, that it would ring true in our hearts, Lord, that you brought us from the outside in with your righteousness and your purity, God. And now that we're in your courts, Lord, if someone is saved, if everyone is saved today, Lord, you're working in us now from the inside out. And Lord, we can stunt our growth. We can stop you from working, Lord, when we simply say within ourselves, Lord, that we don't trust you. And Lord, we show that within our actions and what we do and our thoughts. And I just pray, God, that you would help us to, um, to trust you more, Lord. Help us to put confidence and remember what you've done for us in the past, Lord, and um, and remind us, Lord, that changing a little thing really is nothing to you, Lord, because you'll give us joy and peace in the new action that you want us to do, or the new reaction, the way you want us to react. And I just pray, Lord, that your people here today, Lord, uh, in every church, every believer, Lord, would just uh, praise you more and have more confidence in you. We thank you, Lord, for all you're doing. Praise your name. Amen.